and project personnel meetings prior to the project beginning periodically even once uh, within 30 days of the project. Start the project. Periodically. And it doesn't have a specified six months. Chapter six old for us and old data. And then within 30 days. Anybody here never experienced on the job training? Ever? As, as a client. Yeah, ever. Ever. Has anybody never has anybody never experienced on the job training? You yeah, never had on the job training? Never been applied. Okay. Okay. Now, it's not all that bad. It's a great way to move uh, uh, people through a, a training program into journey level status. Again, what I try to do is put the uh, references up there where we pull the uh, information for each of our each of our uh, contract requirements. Okay, the purpose of the OKP program. Take a minute and I'll read over this. It really is to move uh, economically disadvantaged people through a uh, apprenticeship program <coughs> and bring uh, people into construction trades where we typically have a shortage of of skilled, skilled or semi-skilled labor. What is a disadvantaged person? Disadvantaged person. <laughs> disadvantaged person. It's, a, it's an economically disadvantaged person. Somebody who, because of their family situation, or if they're by themselves, someone who is making ends meet right at or below the poverty. So we would really kind of have a more employee's background to actually yeah. know if they're a disadvantaged person. No, right. exactly. Now, females, minorities are included in that program automatically. Does that mean a white male can't participate in an OJT program? Well, kind of the way it's uh, not necessarily. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. We had, uh, oh, what was it? We had uh, people who were unemployed for just a year, 18 months or so, white male. No work, no W-2 to support any work. Uh, a couple of dependents provided all the documentation that we were able to put them into, into the program. So it's not it's not a program for everybody, but it's a program that can be considered for people who are economically disabled. So I would the to answer your question. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. And yeah, the yeah, has a real good description. Look at it. It's well, so and I've been told that. I've been yeah. told that, well, why can't we put a white male on there? I'm not telling you you can't. Here's the parameters that you have to meet. Submit the documentation. We'll take a look at it, and hopefully we can include that person. Question. Question. Yeah. I'll tell you. Even the last year, we probably received requests for about six white males. Yeah. And we have a pretty pretty good list of white males. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the number of trainees required for the project was based on an incremental dollar amount. And you can find that in uh, chapter five of the, uh, of the uh, compliance manual. Okay, prior to starting up the uh, uh, project, the RCS, I work with the DA and myself, we're going to schedule an OJT training and evaluation meeting. It needs to be after the pre construction meeting and within 30 days of the start, start of work on the project. After pre construction meeting, within 30 days of the start of work on the project. Uh, we had an OJT meeting yesterday, and we started work today. That's not preferred, but just to the nature of the schedule, that's what happened. So, uh, the purpose of the meeting. Determine the amount of OJT training for the project. Discuss the required forms. Answer any questions a contractor may have about the OJT. And provide an opportunity to complete the forms at the meeting. Probably in 15 or 20 OJT meetings over the past year, I think we've got forms maybe half the time at the meeting. It's usually wow, I didn't realize all that. Let me go back and put the schedule together, let me put the efficiencies together, and then I'll send them to you. If that's what I decided, once the meeting's over, I need those sent to me within 10 days to get the project started. If there's some kind of circumstances that say we can't do that, whatever, communicate. Communicate with the RCS, communicate with myself. But typically, that's what we're asking for. Okay, I'm not going to belabor each one of these forms, but we discuss these in detail at the meeting. This is the training schedule. Remember, the core purpose of the meeting is that the training schedule and the proficiency is developed. All the project information filled out at the top. Training classifications listed along the side. Start and end dates for training indicated in the space. So each one of these is 10, is projected one of these blocks is 10 days. So if your project, if your job class, training classification requires 300 hours, then with the project manager, the project administrator, and I'll project out if I want to train a traffic control specialist um, starting mid-May, how long is it going to take me here to get to that 300, uh, the uh, maximum of 300 hours or the minimum of 250 hours, whatever the magic number are? And then you just barcode goes in, start them in, here's your start projected start date, here's your projected end date. A trainee needs to be enrolled, trained, and graduated within that time. So again, RCS can help you fill out the schedule, the A can help you do that, I can help you do that. Then once it's filled out, Contractor submits it, it goes to the project administrator, they concur, comes to me, I concur, and then we're ready to start training. Another thing that's required is the proficiency record. Okay, all project information <coughs> is filled out. <coughs> <by the contractor. coughs> uh, proficiency standards should be filled out and signed by the contractor. That's up here. Anybody know what's the minimum number of proficiencies that needs to be in some of these? Three. 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 It seems for some of the more complex mm -hmm. classifications, mm -hmm. they're four, five, maybe six. Minimum of three proficiencies that need to be listed in the uh, uh, proficiency statement. But again, it goes to the contractor signs it, sends it to the PA, they concur, and then I concur. Once these are set, as you enroll class or as you enroll trainees, this becomes the proficiency observation at the end. All you do is print out, print this off. Put the training's name in there, give it to the uh, member of the project staff. Staff is going to do the proficiency observation, and that's what they're going to use to determine are they able to do all the things that are listed up there to, do, to uh, effectively demonstrate those, those proficiencies. Somebody asked me this why is it observation number one, observation number two, three, four? Why would you think we need those? Multiple tries. <laughs> Not proficient. You said that, Robbie? Not proficient. Yeah. Let's, let's say an employee having a bad day. Went out there, I just can't remember how to turn this piece of paper. Well, you didn't just demonstrate that that way. Let's, you, let's go ahead and get you set up again for another operation. Get you some more training. So that, that's what those are for. Now, if they throw this up and they still can't get it, something's going on. Something's going on. I've not seen that yet. Now, I have seen somebody who didn't quite understand the program. Well, I thought I couldn't submit this call to build in each one of these. So they observed that employee one, two, three, four different times. So okay, so we have the schedule set, proficiencies are set for all your classifications, and now it's time to get the student enrolled. Again, project information at the top filled out. 
training identification should be filled out with a training signature. Here, <coughs> ready to enroll the, the, uh, the uh, employee, contractor signs it, and then once that comes to the RCS, what needs to happen? Okay. Interview, right? You need to get a member of the project staff to go out and interview this trainee to make sure they're a good candidate. The project staff is responsible for that. You as a contractor are responsible to make that employee available to get that interview done. And probably mid year last year, we were getting request in, enrollment request. We were struggling over four or five weeks to get the employee interviewed. That kind of defeats the purpose of going through the program and you're missing dates on the schedule. So once you submit that form, contractor, prime contractor, make sure that employee is available within the next couple of days to be interviewed. Okay, once the interview comes in and it's acceptable, then I can check yes on the acceptable training interview. Roll and approve and get that person enrolled. Key thing to remember, don't start training until you have an approved enrollment. Let me say that again. Don't start training until you have an approved enrollment. When you've got request for enrollment, in line with the schedule, the interview comes in four weeks later, let's say, I said, okay, well, I can approve it this day because we didn't get an interview. We didn't know if the training was eligible for the program or not. I've been training for four weeks. Don't do it until you get the enrollment approved. Okay, because it's training hours from now. We're not officially in the program. Okay, nice thing about this form, this lives with the employee throughout the life, life of their training. They get enrolled, they get requests for graduating, they get to graduate. If there's banking credit involved, you can use this to bank the employees uh, if it's an uh, employee trained in excess of the minimum required. Uh, if there's transfer, if for some reason that type of work stops, you can't complete that employee's training, but you want to get them up to the journey level, we can transfer them to another project and they can complete the training on that project. Or, if you know, fortunate happens, uh, notice the termination. The employee leaves, gets sick, something like that. No determination. So this lives with the training and employees about the life of the question. Okay, OJT forms. Once in, uh, you have a approved enrollment, monthly time report, they're specific to the classification. So you go to the forms website, get a uh, list of uh, Excel documents out there, and pull off the one of that classification. The employee should be provided the morning because they have once they're enrolled so they know what they're expected to be able to do and how their time is tracked throughout the life of the project. Okay, this is filled out every month that they can go from the time employees start until they finish training. We need one of these each month whether or not they actually train. If they didn't train that month, wet weather, they didn't work, that type of work wasn't going on, this one needs to be submitted with zero training hours for that. Okay, they get submitted to the RCS. The 10th. And that's the following month, right? Thank you the following month. Uh, that way the RCS has got it. They'll start reviewing the daily work reports, make sure so that the employees can listen on there. They can also uh, be ready when that certified payroll comes in. It's going to be a month of training hours and verify that the SSS is the NCR employee to strike the office. Uh, Forms of trainee. Are they good? Are they fair? Four? I will say if they're checked for, there's a minimum amount of training hours for proficiency and a maximum. If you're poor, you're, you're going to have to train the employee to the maximum number of training hours. So that means that they're just not getting it yet and they're not ready to graduate. So it comes in checked good. Both boys press it nicely. Then it's no worries. The RCS will review it, verify it against the payroll and other documents, and then we're going to keep it as part of the project. So MTRs every month by the 10th of the month. Okay, other forms. We talked about the training interview form. Proficiency application is the same form as the proficiency statement. We also have some other forms that can be used. Let's say that your classification is listed on the wage decision, but you don't see it on any of the available classifications for training. You can fill out this form. Request a new OJT classification, 
and all three of those commissions seem to be in. I'll get it reviewed. I'll concur. I'll send it to central office. They review it and concur with it, and then we create a new classification for training for this project. It was a special piece of equipment that allows the process. That classification does it. Another form, daily, weekly time report. Daily, weekly time report. We don't specifically ask for those unless the MTRs don't make sense. Get an MTR in, we can't match it up with payroll, we can't match it up with daily work reports, we can't match it up with anything out there, then you need to be completing these, these forms. And uh, a couple of uh, couple contractors that talked to me said we do these because that helps us manage the process with all the MTRs. Uh, top and above all, contractors are resident compliance specialists with questions, especially with their bank controls. Let me briefly explain, <coughs> explain OJT banking. Um, big project, you've got 20 trainees. Multiple years. You go through your 20 trainees and uh, probably a second or the third year, you say, well, I've still got work. I can train additional trainees and thank them for the next federal project. That way, if you get a project, hey, it's only, it's just barely over the department for OJT. I really don't have the type of work that's going to promote that. You can submit a banking credit, a banking certificate in lieu of the training to make it happen. Banking certificates are good for three years throughout the state. So if you get a banking certificate in District 5, you work in District 1, hey, I've got two trainees, I can train one, I've got a banking certificate, I'm going to go ahead and turn them into a separate one. So if you if you have that, if you have that capability, by all means, let's, let's do that. And just a side note, you non-federal aid projects require OJT. However, you can thank people on non-federal projects if you've got the work to support the training, as long as you're willing to do all the OJT documents and provide certified payrolls for that employee. If that's an option, come, come talk to us, we'll, we'll make sure that's it. And just to kind of put it in perspective, uh, Archie Lester, um, how, how many OJT trainees do you all have on your project? I think there's only about three right now, but we need to get some but, more. But, 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 but how many are required? That I don't know. Uh, that's that's what I, have I think it's 20, 20 some odd. Is that what it was? Yeah, and there's another project in here that's got. 250. And how many are enrolled right now? We are at 27 graduated 12. That's your first of six. So again, if, if, if you get a project that's $5 million and you've got three or four trainees, I don't feel that way. Okay, so typically ask, ask questions for OJT. How do I know if my project has OJT? Okay Two million and two hundred seventy-five days or more of what this year? When do I need to turn in the OJT schedule? There's two answers for this. No, 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 the schedule. We don't have to turn in the original schedule. At the OJT meeting. Ten days after. Okay, I hear a lot of days after the OJT. You can turn it in at the training evaluation meeting, or you can turn it in within ten days after that training evaluation. Okay, and I heard fourteen days. What's important about 14 days on the OJT schedule? Somebody tell me what's important about 14 days on the OJT schedule. Missing a start date. Start. You know, everybody can hear. Everybody can hear. Say it one more time. When the schedule's set, to on typical contracts, if an event is missed by 14 days or more, hey, I'm yeah, starting the trainee days. on the first of May. If something happened and I can't get them started for 20th of May. Yeah, this is going to be for 14 days. So what do you do? We do the schedule. Resubmit the schedule. That's good. Not a big deal. Okay, so if an event on the schedule is missed by 14 days or more, resubmit and turn off the schedule. Okay, or if I don't see a classification listed in the compliance manual, but I need to train somebody to do that special call. 
Contract the RCS and request the OJT, OJT additional classification request, right? And if it's not on your wage decision, then you need to get that submitted first. Additional classification for the wage decision. Okay, when does OJT interview need to be performed? Prior to approval, right? Yeah, prior to approval and roll. Make sure to meet. And it's contractor's responsibility to make sure that the employees are able to be done. Okay, so again, that's OJT <coughs> Not every project has it. It's a great tool to get you into an emergency status. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just managing the submission of forms and making sure we're more important than employees during the graduation. This is not fair to them if they get delayed. Any questions on OJT? Okay, with that, I think we're going to have. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to bring Cheryl back up. You'll have a certified payroll on your desk, and then you have kind of a job aid on just some information. Yeah. 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 Remember the trainee? When you have a trainee on the payroll,